Hey, what's up you guys? It's Dorothy and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we're going to go into chapter 11 of 13 Reasons Why by Jay Asher. Um, we are just about done with this book. We have six chapters left to read, including this one, so let's get right into this video. This video may contain sensitive topics and foul language. If you do not wish to continue, I suggest clicking off of the video now. You have been warned. Chapter 11, Cassette 5, Side A. The glass door to Rosie's closes behind me and I hear three locks immediately slide into place. So now we're home, back to Monet's, or maybe I'll go to the library after all. I can sit outside the concrete steps, listen to the reminder of the tapes and the remainder of the tapes in the dark. Clay, it's Tony's voice. Bright headlights flash three times. The driver's side window is down and Tony's outstretched hand waves me over. I tug the zipper on my jacket up and walk over to his window, but I don't lean in. I don't feel like talking, not now. Tony and I have known each other for years, working on projects and joking around after class, and all that time we never had a deep conversation. Now I'm afraid he wants to have one. He's been sitting here this whole time, just sitting in his car, waiting. What else could he could be on his mind? He won't look at me. Instead, he reaches out to adjust the side mirror with his thumb. Then he closes his eyes and lets his head fall forward. Get in, Clay. Is everything all right? After a short pause, slowly he nods. I rock around the front of his car, open the passenger door, and sit, keeping one foot out on the black top. I place my backpack with Hannah's shoebox inside it on my lap. Shut the door, he says. Where are we going? It's okay, Clay. Just shut the door. He winds the handle of his door and his window slides up. It's cold outside. His gaze slips from the dashboard to the stereo to his steering wheel, but he won't face me. The moment I pull the door shut like the trigger on a steering starting pistol, he begins. You're the ninth person I've had to follow, Clay. What? What are you talking about? The second set of tapes, he says. Hannah wasn't bluffing. I've got them. Oh, God. I cover my face with both hands behind my eyebrow. The pounding is back again. With the base of my palm, I press on... Press on it hard. It's okay, he says. I can't look at him. What does he know about me? What has he heard? What's okay? What were were you listening to in there? What? Which tape? I can try and deny it, deny it, pretend I have no clue what he's talking about, or I can get out of his car and leave, but either way, he knows. It's okay, Clay. Honest. Which tape? With my eyes still shut, I press my knuckles against my forehead. Ryan's, I say. The poem. Then I look at him. He leans his head back, eyes closed. What? I ask. No answer. Why'd she give them to you? He touches the keychain dangling in the ignition. Can I drive while you listen to the next tape? Tell me why she gave them to you. I'll tell you, he says, if you'll just listen to the next tape right now. Why? Clay, I'm not joking. Listen to the tape. Then answer my question. Because it's about you, Clay. He lets go of his keys. The next tape is about you. Nothing. My heart doesn't jump, my eyes don't flinch, I don't breathe, and then I snap my arm back, my elbow into the seat, then I smash it into the door, and I want to pound my head sideways into the window, but I pound it back against the headrest instead. Tony lays a hand on my shoulder, listen to it, he says, and don't leave this car. He turns the ignition, with tears falling, I roll my head to face him, but he's start staring straight ahead. I open the door of the Walkman and pull out the tape, the fifth tape. A dark blue number nine in the corner, my tape. I am number nine. I drop the tape back into the Walkman and holding the player in both hands, close it like a book. Tony puts the car in gear and drives through the empty parking lot heading for the street. Without looking, I run my thumb across the top of the Walkman, feeling for the button that brings me into the story. Romeo, oh Romeo, wherefore out thou Romeo? My story, my tape, this is how it begins. Good question, Juliet, and I wish I knew the answer. Tony shouts over the engine, Clay, it's okay. To be totally honest, there was never a point where I said to myself, Clay Jensen, he's the one. Just hearing my name, the pain in my head doubles. I feel agonizing twist in my heart. I'm not even sure how much of the real Clay Jensen I got to know over the years. Most of what I knew was secondhand information, and that's why I wanted to know him better. Because everything I heard, and I mean everything, was good. It was one of those things where once I noticed it, I couldn't stop noticing it. Kristen Renart, for example, she's always wears black, black pants or black shoes, black shirt. If it's a black jacket and that's the only black she's wearing, she won't take it off all day. The next time you see her, you'll notice it, and then you won't be able to stop noticing it. Steve Oliver's the same way. Whenever he raises his hand to say something or ask a question, he always begins with the words, All right, Mr. Oliver, all right. If Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner, Mr. Oliver, all right, I got 76.1225. Mr. Oliver, all right, can I have a hall pass? Seriously, every time, and now you'll notice it too, every time. Yes, I've noticed it, Hannah, but let's, let's get on with it, please. Overhearing gossip about Clay became a similar distraction, and like I said, I didn't know him very well, but my ears perked 
up whenever I heard his name. I guess I wanted to hear something, anything juicy. Not because I wanted to spread gossip. I just couldn't believe that someone could be that good. Uh, excuse me. I glance at Tony and roll my eyes, but he's driving, looking straight ahead. If he actually was that good, wonderful, great. But it became a personal game of mine. How long could I go on hearing nothing but good things about Clay Jensen? Normally, when a person has a stellar image, another person's waiting in the wings to tear them apart. They're waiting for the fatal flaw to expose itself, but not with Clay. Again, I look over at Tony this time. He's smirking. I hope this tape doesn't make you run out and dig for the deep, dark, and dirty secret of his life, of his, which I'm sure is there, at least one or two of them, right? I've got a few, but wait, isn't that what you're doing, Hannah? You're setting him up as Mr. Perfect only to tear him down. You, Hannah Baker, were the one waiting in the wings, waiting for a flaw, and you found it, and now you can't wait to tell everyone what it is and ruin his image, to which I say, no. My chest relaxes, freeing a breath of air that I didn't even know I was holding, and I hope you're not disappointed. I hope you aren't just listening, salivating for gossip. I hope these tapes mean more to you than that. Clay, honey... Your name does not belong on this list. I lean my head against the window and close my eyes, concentrating on the glass. Maybe if I listen to the words but concentrate on the cold, maybe I can hold it together. You don't belong in the same way as the others. It's like that song. One of those things is not like the others. One of these things just doesn't belong. And that's you, Clay. But you need to be here if I'm going to tell my story, to tell it more completely. Why do I have to hear this, I ask. Why didn't she just skip me if I don't belong? Tony keeps driving. If he looks anywhere other than the straight ahead, it's only briefly and to the rearview mirror. I would have been happier never hearing this, I say. Tony shakes his head. No, it would drive you crazy not knowing what happened to her. I stare through the windshield at the white lines glowing in the headlights and I realize he's right. Besides, he says, I think she wanted you to know. Maybe I think, maybe I think, but why? Where are we going? He doesn't answer. Yes, there are some major gaps in my story, some parts I just couldn't figure out how to tell or couldn't bring myself to say out loud, events I haven't come to grips with that I'll never come to grips with, and if I never have to say them out loud, then I never have to think them all the way through, but does that diminish any of our stories? Are your stories any less meaningful because I'm not telling you everything? No. Actually, it magnifies them. You don't know what went on in the rest of my life at home, even at school. You don't know what goes on in anyone's life but your own. And when you mess with one part of a person's life, you're not messing with just that part. Unfortunately, you can't be the precise and selective. When you mess with one part of a person's life, you're messing with your entire life. Everything affects everything. The next few stories are centered around one night the party they're connected around one night clay and you know what i mean by our night <clears throat> because they're through all the years we've spent going to the same school or working together at the movie theater there's only one night we when we connected when we really connected that night drags many of you into the story as well one of you for the second time a random night that none of you can take back i hated that night even before these these tapes i hated it that night, I ran to tell an old woman that her husband was fine, everything was going to be fine, but I was lying because while I was running to comfort his wife, the other driver was dying. The old man, by the time he got to his wife, he knew it. Hopefully, no one will hear these tapes except for those of you on the list, leaving any changes they bring to your lives completely up to you. Of course, if the tapes do get out, you'll have to deal with consequences completely out of your control, so I sincerely hope you're passing them on. I glance at Tony. Would he really do that? Could he? Would he give the tapes to someone not on the list? Who? For some of you, those consequences be may be minimal, maybe shame or embarrassment, but for others, it's hard to say. A lost job? Jail time? Let's keep this between us, shall we? So, Clay, I wasn't even supposed to be at that party. I was invited, but I wasn't supposed to be there. My grades were slipping pretty fast. My parents asked for progress reports every week from my teachers, and when none of them came back with improvements, I was grounded. For me, grounded meant that I had one hour to get home from school, one hour being me, my only free time until I brought those grades up. We're at a stoplight and still, Tony keeps his eyes straight ahead. Does he want to avoid seeing me cry because he doesn't have to worry? I'm not. Not right now. During one of my Clay Jensen gossip moments, I found out that you were going to be at the party. What? Clay Jensen at a party? Unheard of. I study on the weekends and most of my classes were tested. Every Monday, it's not my fault. Not only was that my first thought, that's what... The people around me were talking about, too. No one could figure out why they never saw you at parties. Of course, they had all sorts of theories, but guess what? That's right. None of them were bad. Give me a break. <coughs> 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 Excuse me.
excuse me. <coughs> As you know, since Tyler's not all not tall enough to peep through a second story window, sneaking out of my bedroom wasn't hard to do. And that night I just had to do it. But don't jump to conclusions. I've snuck out of my house before that night only twice. Okay, three times, maybe four tops. For those of you who don't know which party I'm talking about, there's a red star on your map, a big fat red star completely filled in C6512 Cottonwood. Is that where we're going? Ah, so now you know. Now some of you know exactly where you fit in. But you'll have to wait until your name pops up to hear what I'm going to tell, to hear how much I tell. That night, I decided that walking to the poet photo party would be nice, relaxing. We had a lot of rain that week, and I remember the clouds were still hanging low and thick. The air was warm for that time of night, too. My absolute favorite time of weather. Mine, too. Pure magic. It's funny. Walking by the houses on my way to the party, it felt like life had so many possibilities, limitless possibilities, and for the first time in a long time, I felt a hope. So did I. I forced myself out of the house and to that party. I was ready for something new to happen, something exciting. Hope. Well, I guess I misread things a bit. And now, knowing what happened between Hannah and me, would I still have gone, even if nothing changed? It was simply the calm before the storm. I would, yes, even if the outcome stayed the same. I wore a black skirt with a matching hood of hood pullover, and on my way there, I took a three-block detour to my old house, the one I lived in with when we first moved to town. The first red star from the first side of the first tape, the porch light was on, and the in the garage, a car's engine was running, but the garage door was shut. Am I the only one who knows this? Does anyone else know that that's where he lived? The man from the accident, the man whose car killed a student from our school? I stopped walking, and for what seemed like several minutes, just watched from the sidewalk, mesmerized another family in my house. I had no idea who they were or what they were like, what their lives were like. The garage door began to lift, and in the glow of the red tail lights, the silhouette of a man pushed the heavy door all the way up. He got in the car, backed it down the driveway, and drove off. He didn't stop. Why didn't he ask why I was standing there staring at his house? I don't know. Maybe he thought I was waiting for him to back out of the driveway before continuing on my merry way. But whatever the reason, it felt surreal. Two people, me and him, one house, yet he drove away with no idea of his link to me. The girl on the sidewalk, and for some reason... At that moment, the air felt heavy, filled with loneliness, The lon and that loneliness stayed with me through the rest of the night. Even the best moments of the night were affected by that one incident, by that non-incident. In, in front of my old house, his lack of interest in me was a reminder. Even though I had a history in that house, it didn't matter. You can't go back to how things were, how you thought they were. All you really have is now. Those of us on the tapes, we can't go back either. We can never not find a package on our doorstep or in our mailbox from the moment on we're different, which explains my overreaction, Clay. And that's why you'll get these tapes to explain, to say, I'm sorry. Does she remember? Does she remember that I apologized to her that night? Is that why she's apologizing to me? The party was well underway by the time I got there. Most people, unlike me, didn't have to wait for their parents to fall asleep. The usual crowd hung out by the front door of the party, drunk out of their minds, greeting everyone with a raised cup of beer. I would think Hannah would be a hard name to slur, but those guys did it pretty well. Half of them kept repeating my name, trying to get it right, while the other half laughed. But they were harmless. Fun drunks make a nice addition to any party. Not looking to fight, not looking to score, just looking to get drunk and laugh. I remember those guys like the mascots of the party. Clay, what you do... What you do done here, bah ha ha. The music was loud and no one was dancing. I could have been any party except for one thing, Clay Jensen. I'm sure you heard a lot of sarcastic remarks when you first arrived, but by the time I got there, to everyone else, you were just a part of the party. But unlike everyone else, you were the whole reason I came. With everything going on in my life, going on in my head, I wanted to talk with you. Really talk. Just once. A chance we never seemed to get at school or at work. A chance to ask, who are you? We didn't get that chance because I was afraid. Afraid I had no chance with you. That's what I thought and I was fine with that because what if I got to know you and it turned out to be just like they said? What if you weren't the person I hoped you were? That more than anything would hurt, have hurt the most as, and as I stood in the kitchen in line to fill my cup for the first time, you walked up behind me. Hannah Baker, you said, and I turned towards you. Hannah, hey. When the first... 
When she first arrived, when she walked through the front door, she caught me off guard, and like a freak, I turned around, ran through the kitchen, and straight out the back. It was too soon, I told myself. I went to the party telling myself that if Hannah Baker showed up, I was going to talk to her. It was time. I didn't care who was there. I was going to keep my eyes focused on her, and we were going to talk. But then she walked in, and I freaked out. I couldn't believe it. Out of the blue, there you were. No, not out of the blue. First, I placed around the black backyard, cursing myself for being such a scared little boy. Then I let myself out through the gate, fully intent on walking home. But on the sidewalk, I beat myself up for some more. Then I walked back in the front door. The drunk people greeted me again, and I went straight for you. It was anything but out of the blue. I don't know why you said, but I think we need to talk. I took all the guts in the world to keep the conversation going, guts and two plastic cups of beer, and I agreed with probably the dumbest smile plastered on my face. No, the most beautiful. And then I noticed the door frame behind you leading into the kitchen. It had a bunch of pen and pencil marks scratched on it, keeping track of how fast the children in the house were growing. And I remembered watching my mom erase those marks on our old kitchen door, getting ready to sell the house to move here. I saw that. I saw something in your eyes when you looked over my shoulder. Anyway, you looked at my empty cup, poured half of your drink into mine, and asked if now would be a good time to talk. Please don't read into that. People... Yes, it sounds all smooth and get the girl drunk, but it wasn't. It didn't seem that way to me. It wasn't. No one's going to buy that, That's, but it's true. <coughs> because if that was the case, he would have encouraged me to fill up my cup all the way. So we walked into the living room where one side of the couch was occupied by Jessica Davis and Justin Foley, but there was plenty of room on the other end, so we sat down, and what was the first thing we did? We sat our cups and sat down our cups and started talking just like that. She had to know it was them, Jessica and Justin, but she didn't say their names. The first boy she kissed, kissing the girl who slapped her at Monet's. It was like she couldn't escape her past. Everything I could have hoped for was happening. The questions were personal as if catching up for the time we let pass, yet the questions never felt intrusive. Her voice is physically possible. Her voice, if physically possible, comes through the headphones feeling warm. I placed placed cup hands over my ears to keep her words from escaping and they weren't intrusive because I wanted you to know me it was wonderful I couldn't believe Hannah and I were finally talking really talking and I did not want it to stop I love talking with you Hannah it seemed like you could know me like you could understand anything I told you and the more we spoke I knew why the same things excited us the same things concerned us you could have told me anything, Hannah. That night, nothing was off limits. I could have stayed till you opened up and let everything out, but you didn't. I wanted to tell you everything, and that hurt because some things were too scary. Some things even I didn't understand. How could I tell someone, someone I really, I was really talking to for the first time, everything I was thinking? I couldn't. It was too soon, but it wasn't. Or maybe it was too late. But you're telling me now. Why did you wait till now? Her words, they're not warm anymore. She might want me to hear them that way, but they're burning me up instead. In my mind, in my heart, Clay, you kept saying that you knew things would flow easily between us. You felt that way for a long time, you said. You knew we'd get along, that we'd connect, but how? You never explained that. How could you know? Because I knew what people said about me. I heard all the rumors and lies that will always be a part of me. I knew they weren't true, Hannah. I mean, I hoped they weren't true, but I was too afraid to find out. I was breaking. If only I talked to you sooner, we could have been, we could have, I don't know, but things had gone too far by then. My mind was set, not on ending my life, not yet. It was set on floating through school, on never being close to anyone. That was my plan. I'd graduate, then I'd leave. But then I went to a party. I went to a party to meet you. Why did I do that? To make myself suffer? Because that's what I was doing. Hating myself for want, waiting so long. Hating myself because it wasn't fair to you. The only thing that's not fair are these tapes, Hannah, because I was there for you. We were talking. You could have said anything. I would have listened to absolutely anything. The couple of sitting beside us on the couch, the girl was drunk and laughing and bumping into me every so often, which was funny at first, but it got old real fast. Why isn't Hannah saying her name? I started to think maybe she wasn't so drunk after all. Maybe it was a show for the guy she was talking with. When they were actually talking, maybe she wanted the couch all to herself and her guy. So Clay and I left. We walked around the party shouting over the music whatever, wherever we went. Eventually, successfully, I spun the conversation around. No more big and heavy topics. We needed to laugh, but everywhere we went, it was too noisy to hear each other. 
So we wound up in the doorway to an empty room. I remember everything that happened next. I remember it perfectly, but how does she remember it? While we were standing there, our backs against the doorframe, drinks in hand, we couldn't stop laughing, and yet the loneliness I entered the party with came rushing back, but it wasn't. A, but I wasn't alone. I knew that. For the first time in a long time, I was connecting, connected with another person from school. How in the world was I alone? You weren't, Hannah. I was there because I wanted to be. That's all I can say. It's all that makes sense to me. How many times had I left myself connect with someone only to have it thrown back in my face? Everything seemed good, but I knew it had the potential to be awful, much, much more painful than the others. There was no way that that was going to happen. So there you were, letting me connect with you, and when I couldn't do that anymore, when I pulled the conversation to lighter topics, you made me laugh, and you were hilarious, Clay. You were exactly what I needed, so I kissed you. No, I kissed you, Hannah. A long and beautiful kiss. And what did you say when we came up for air with the cutest little boyish smirk you asked? What was that for? Right, you kiss me. To which I said, you're such an idiot, and we kissed some more. An idiot, yes, I remember that too. Eventually, we shut the door and moved deeper into the room. We were on the side of the door and the rest of the party was with its loud but muffled music was on the other. Amazing. We were together. That's what I kept thinking the whole time. Amazing. I had to concentrate so hard to keep that word from spilling out of my mouth. Some of you may be wondering how come we never heard about this. We always found out who Hannah made out with because I never told. Wrong. You only thought you found out. Haven't you been listening or did you only pay attention to the tape with your name on it? Because I cannot... On one hand, yes, one hand, how many people I've made out with. Because I can count on one hand, yes, one hand, how many people I've made out with. But you, you probably thought I need both hands and both feet to get, just to get started right. What's that? You don't believe me? You're shocked? Guess what? I don't care. The last time I cared about, cared what anyone thought about me was the night, that night. And that was the last night I unbuckled my seatbelt and leaned forward. I clasped my hand hand over my mouth and squeeze to keep from screaming but I do scream the sound dampered in my palm my of my hand and Tony keeps driving now get comfortable because I'm about to tell you what happened in that room between Clay and me are you ready we kissed that's it we kissed I looked down at my lap at the Walkman it's too dark to see the spindles behind the plastic window pulling the tape from one side to the other but I need to focus on something so I try and concentrating on the spot where the two spindles should be is the closest I get to looking into Hannah's eyes as she tells me as she tells my story it was wonderful both of us lying on bed one of his hands resting on my hip his other arm cradling my head like a pillow both of my arms hugging him trying to pull him closer and speaking for myself i wanted more that's when i said it that's when i whispered to her i'm so sorry because inside i felt so happy and sad at the same time sad to think that it took me so long to get there but happy that we were there together the kisses felt like first kisses kisses that said i could start over if i wanted to with him but start over from what and that's when i thought of you justin for the first time in a long time i thought of our first kiss my real first kiss I remembered the anticipation leading up to it. I remembered your lips pressed against mine, and then I remembered how you ruined it. Stop, I told Clay, and my hands stopped pulling him in. You pushed your hands against my chest. Could you feel what I was going through, Clay? Did you sense it? You must have. No, you hid it. You never told me what it was, Hannah. I shut my eyes so tight it was painful, trying to push away all that I was seeing in my head, and what I saw was everyone on the list and more. Everyone up to that night, everyone who caused me to be so intrigued by Clay's reputation, how his reputation was so different from mine. No, we were the same, and I couldn't help that. What everyone thought of me was out of my control. Clay, your reputation was deserved, but mine, mine was not. And there I was with you adding to my reputation, but it, was, it wasn't like that. Who was I going to tell Hannah? Stop, I repeated. This time I moved my hands under your chest and pushed you away. I turned to to the side burying my face in the pillows you started to talk but i made you stop i asked you to leave you started to talk again and i screamed i screamed into the pillow and then you stopped talking you heard me the bed lifted on your side as you got up to leave the room but it took you forever to leave to realize that i was serious i was hoping you'd tell me to stop again to stop leaving even though my eyes remained shut buried in the pillow the light changed when you finally opened the door it grew brighter then it faded again and then you were gone why did I listen? Why did I leave her there? She needed me, and I knew that, but I was scared. Once again, I let myself get scared, and then I slid off the bed and down to the floor. I just sat there beside the bed, hugging my knees and crying. That, Clay, is where your story ends.
but it shouldn't have. I was there for you, Hannah. You could have reached out, but you didn't. You chose this. You had a choice and you pushed me away. I would have helped you. I wanted to help you. <coughs> you left the room and, were never, and we never spoke again. Your mind was set no matter what you say it was set. In the hallways at school, you tried catching my eye, but I always looked away because that night when I got home, I tore a page from my notebook and wrote down one name after another after another, the names in my head when I stopped kissing you. There were so many names, Clay, three dozen at least, and then I made the connections. I circled your name first, Justin, and I drew a line from you to Alex. I circled Alex and drew a line to Jessica, bypassing names that didn't connect. That just floated there, incidents, but all by themselves. My anger and frustration with all of you turned to tears, and then back to anger and hate every time I found a new connection. And then I reached Clay. The reason I went to the party, I circled his name and drew a line back back to a previous name it was justin in fact clay soon after you left and shut the door that person reopened it on justin's tape the first tape she said his name would reappear and he was at the party on the couch with jessica but that person's already received the tapes so clay just skip him when he passed them on in a roundabout way he caused a new name to be added to this list and that's why and that's who should receive the tapes from you and yes, Clay, I'm sorry too. My eyes sting, not from the salt in my tears, but because I haven't closed them since lear learning Hannah cried when I left the room. Every muscle in my neck burns to turn away, to look out the window away from the Walkman and let my eyes stare into nothing, but I can't bring myself to move to break the effect of her words. Tony slows the car and pulls over to the curb. You okay? It's a residential street, but it's not the street of the party. I shake my head no. Are you going to be okay, he asks. I lean back, resting my head against the seat and close my eyes. I miss her. I miss her too, he says, and when I open my eyes, his head is down. Is he crying or maybe trying not to cry? The thing is, I say, I never really missed her till now. He sits back in his seat and looks over at me. I didn't know what to make of that night. Everything that happened, I liked her for so long from far away, but I never had a chance to tell her. I look down at the Walkman. We only had one night, and by the end of that night, it seemed like I knew her even less than before, but... But now I know, I know where her mind was that night. Now I know what she was going through. My voice breaks and in that break comes a flood of tears. Tony doesn't respond. He looks out the, into the empty street, allowing me to sit in his car and just miss her, to miss her each time I pull in a breath of air, to miss her with a heart that feels so cold by itself, but warm when the thoughts of her flow through me. I wipe the cuff of my jacket under my eyes then I choke back my tears and laugh. Thanks for listening to all of that. I say, next time, it's okay to stop me. Tony turns on the blinker, looks over his shoulder, and pulls us back into the street, but he doesn't look at me. You're welcome. That is the end of this chapter. I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.